The most surprising thing about the Principia Mathematica is its fundamental claim, which is that there is a mathematical science now available, capable of mastering all the phenomena of the cosmos. Um, the techniques Newton develops involve measuring uh, forces and changes of force by increments of motion um, at tangents to orbits around force centers and that the times bodies move in such orbits are well measured by the areas the radius vector joining that body to the force center uh, sweeps out. So this is to build up off of the Keplerian tradition in astronomy but universalize it. And that must have been astonishing. And the most expert uh, natural philosophers and astronomers of the period, uh, especially the experts in mixed mathematics like Leibniz and Huygens, were overwhelmingly impressed by the capacity of the work to extend these fundamental techniques of mixed mathematical analysis to the cosmos as a unified and coherent system. And then um, the development of these techniques, as they are applied to the widest possible range of forms of motion, is the other aspect of the work's astonishing originality and surprise. The relation in particular between what's to be found in the opening and middle propositions of the first book uh, on uh, the motion of bodies in empty space and the third book on the system of the world is startling indeed. Because on the one hand, there's a series of mixed mathematical demonstrations in book one which took the powers of mathematical analysis of motion far beyond where any of his contemporaries had reached in the 1680s. A good example of this, perhaps one of the most beautiful demonstrations in the whole of the Principia, is Newton's demonstration that if force varies as one over the square of the distance from the force centre, then we can treat um, the force exerted by a sphere as if it all acts from its centre. It's absolutely not trivial to demonstrate that, and Newton's demonstration is one of the masterpieces of the work, in fact one of the masterpieces of the history of mathematics and of mathematical physics. And there's a whole series of demonstrations like that which are necessary to build up the structure of analysis which underwrites book one. And then what we see in the third book, in the system of the world, is the systematic application of those principles across an astonishingly wide range of phenomena. First of all, the demonstration that each of the planet systems, in other words, each of the system of sun and planet taken on its own, insofar as Newton's able to do this, obeys the principles set out in book one and that since each of them taken on their own obeys those principles, those principles can be universalized. So there is but one force, a force which is now going to be called universal gravitation, which acts instantly through empty space between the centers of all particles in the universe whatsoever. And this is part of the genial quality of the third book. If that is true, then uh, the demonstrations in the earlier part of that book can't be strictly accurate. Because, for example, if the Sun and Jupiter pull on each other with a force of gravitation when they're considered in isolation, and it's true that all other particles of matter in the universe also pull on the Sun and Jupiter, then you cannot consider this as an isolated system. There will therefore be perturbations in those movements and Newton begins the great 
project in celestial mechanics of analysing those perturbations. Now that again struck the most expert readers as an astonishing achievement of enormous ambition that it wasn't just, as it were, that Newton had summed across each of the sun-planet uh, doublets and shown that for each of them this was a Keplerian Newtonian system, that if you put them all together this was a super Newtonian Keplerian system with perturbations which themselves could be analysed at least in principle. And it's in the case of the moon, the motion of the moon as it's affected both by the earth and the sun, that Newton reached his greatest challenge in this theory of perturbations, a challenge he never quite delivered on, but a challenge that he clearly set forth as a research task for subsequent analysts. And then that in turn is extended to the movement of the sea, the movement of tides. This is the first successful mathematical model, in fact, the first mathematical model really of any kind of tidal motion. And it includes, uh, just in passing, the first systematic account of wave interference.